All right, good evening, everybody, or good day, whichever time you're listening to this. Um, so tonight we're gonna be covering financing uh, when dealing with real estate. Now, of course, you'll be completing an entire course, um, actually an entire, yeah, it's actually an entire course on real estate financing. And we'll probably do that, I believe, in the next two courses. So uh, what we're gonna cover this evening, like I said, is dealing with real estate financing. Uh, there's a lot of material. What I am teaching tonight is basically gonna encompass everything, okay? So everything in the finance course is gonna be covered right here. So that entire course is gonna be summed up right here. Um, so with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and get started because if you've seen the slides, there are 40, 41, I think, slides, and I've got two hours to teach all of this. So we've got to get, get the ball rolling. So what we're going to start off with, we're going to identify the basic components of a promissory note. We're going to define the loan origination fee, the discount points, and prepayment penalty. We'll also explain what a deed of trust is and why lenders prefer it and explain the use of a land contract or owner financing. Uh, so these are gonna be some of them that we are going to cover this evening. We're also going to identify the two general types of foreclosure proceedings, identify the types of institutions in the primary and secondary mortgage market, describe the various types of financing techniques that are also available, and discuss the significance of private mortgage insurance on conventional loans, compare the FHA and VA governmental loans, explain the role of government financing regulation through truth and lending, equal credit opportunity, and the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. All right, so as you can tell, there's a lot of stuff that we're gonna cover this evening, uh, and it's very important that you understand this because Finance is actually the biggest area that a lot of people fail in, okay? When they take the licensing exam, this is the area everybody complains about. I don't understand financing. I don't understand the whole mortgage process. I don't understand any of those things, okay? So when it comes into this particular situation, the mortgage law is basically broken down into a couple of different theories. Now, the first theory is going to be what we call the lien theory, okay? Now, what exactly is a lien? Colton, do you remember yesterday what we talked about a lien is? What exactly is a lien, sir? Uh, something that attaches to property. What was that something? Starts with a D. D E B T. Uh, debt. debt. Okay. So mortgage is a debt. Okay. So when we're talking about lien theory, what we're discussing in this particular situation is we're talking about the mortgagor is going to end up retaining legal and equitable title while the mortgagee has a lien on the property as security for the mortgage debt. Now, Miss Linda, what does this right here, this bottom sentence here of that bullet say right there? Texas is a lien theory state, meaning the mortgagor is who, Miss Linda? The, the buyer or the lender? No, the buyer. The borrower is going to be the mortgagor. The lender is going to be the, the mortgagee. The reason you can tell that is because it said has a lien on the property. The borrower would not have a lien on the property, if that makes sense. Okay, so in that particular situation, the mortgage or the borrower or the buyer will retain legal and equitable title, but the mortgagee, the lender, has a lien on the property as security for the mortgage debt. Okay, so in this particular situation, we're ending up, we're going to have this different viewpoint here where you're going to have the mortgage or the buyer will retain both legal and equitable interests, but in the same situation is, is that you're going to end up, you're gonna end up having where 
the client or the lender will hold the security against the home in case the mortgage or fails to pay. Okay, so you have to remember that in this situation, Texas is a lien theory state. Okay, now in what we call a modified lien theory is that title remains with the borrower, okay, but the lender may take back title to the property if the borrower defaults on the loan. Same kind of concept, but what ends up happening is, is that the title will remain with them, but they don't actually go and file something against the title that's stated as a lien. So if you don't pay, the lender just comes back and takes it back from you. Okay, they just have to show that you've not paid. Now, what did we say the other day when we were having class in here, Mr. Eugene? I said earlier, I said, um, how many people, how many of your family says that they've got to pay their mortgage? And I said, is that correct? No. What are you actually paying, Miss Linda? No, not the deed. Promissory note. The promissory note is what you're paying. What does that word look like, Mr. Uh, Colton? That first word, what does that word look like? What other word does that look like? A promise, okay? So it's a promise to pay your note, okay? So a promissory note, as it's defined, is also called a note or financing instrument and the borrower's personal promise to repay the debt according to the agreed upon terms, okay? So, Miss Linda, in this particular situation, if you buy a house, when you bought a house, you signed a promissory note. And what did you promise to tell the lender that's borrowing you the money? What did you tell the lender? That you're going to pay the debt off and you're going to pay it off on time. That's your plan. That is your agreed terms that you have. Okay. Now, what are the elements? Well, the first element is going to be the amount of the debt. Okay. How much debt do I actually have? Number two, we got to have the time and the method of payment. We, Miss Linda needs to know when she needs to pay. When does she need to pay? How does she pay it? Is there any, and here's something I also want you to put down, the word interest, I want you to put next to that word, I want you to put equal sign, and I want you to say payment, or what you can say is rental of money, okay? Interest is the rental of money. Mr. Colton, let me ask you this question. If you give me $100 right now, Mr. Colton gives me a hundred bucks. Do you have a hundred bucks now, Mr. Colton? No, if I got your hundred bucks, do you got a hundred bucks? No. So if you had a hundred bucks, could you possibly double, triple, quadruple that hundred bucks if you had it? Yeah. But if you give it to me, can you triple, quadruple or any of that? No. So you should get something for me using your money, right? So you should charge for me using your cash. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're talking about in interest, is it is a charge for me to utilize someone else's money, okay? Now, the next one is what we call usury. And this is where we're charging interest in excess of the maximum set by law. So what we're talking in this particular situation is this. Mr. Um, Colton has given me his $100. Now, Mr. Colton can charge me up to say 10%, okay? The law says Colton can charge me 10% in interest without it being considered as excessive, okay? But if you charge over 10%, say you charge me 11%, it's classified as usury, and what happens is you're charging in excess of this and you can end up being sued and actually criminal charges held against you for charging over what the government allows you to charge. Why is that? Why do you think, Colton, that the government would want to stipulate how much an individual can charge for the rental or use of another person's money? Exactly. 
because if we didn't have this, what would happen here, Colton? If we didn't have this part right here. Could you charge me 100% per day of interest? Yeah. Would I ever get out of debt to you? No, I'd be in debt to you forever. So in that situation is the government created usury to allow individuals not to be indebted to banks for the remainder of their life. Now, some people will say 20% is too much. Do y'all think that they charge 20% interest on, uh, on debt? Doesn't matter. Do they charge 20% of interest? Heck yeah. Heck yeah. That's why people, what happens when they get credit cards? What ends up happening, Mr. Eugene? And what happens to you? And do you ever get out of that? that I, we, I don't like using the word up, 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 even though it does go up, up. You really just dig in a hole for yourself until what happens you're so far down that you can't see the light anymore okay and in that situation you end up you basically have to go bankrupt now mr colton if you borrowed money to mr grossman and you're rich and he's bankrupt do you give a crap about mr seven no so what happened was this occurred a lot people in that situation is is that they ended up people would get so far in the hole, they couldn't get back up. So they ended up, they'd lose everything, okay? And used to a long time ago, they used to have a thing called debtor's prison. If you ever watch Scrooge, uh, Scrooge around this time of the year, what happens is, is it's basically, you couldn't pay your debts, you went to prison. And you went there and you were locked up, okay? There was no option. But in this situation, we don't have to worry about that anymore because it's not required, okay? Now, further element. There is what's called a loan origination fee. Very, very important on this one. A loan origination fee in this particular situation is in this aspect. It is the fee for an individual, a bank or a lender, to create the loan, okay? So when you purchase, Mr. Colton, when you were going to school, did you ever use student loans? No. Do you have friends or family that have used student loans? Yeah. Okay. They don't know this because they're college kids, but every time they borrow student loans, 1% of the total amount is assessed against them. So say they borrow $10,000 a semester. 1,000 of that is going to the lender just for doing the paperwork. How do you like that, Mr. Colton? And by the way, Mr. Colton, let's think about this. Do you think these banks actually sit down and handwrite a contract out anymore? No, what do they end up doing? Print it out. It's already just fill in the blank, print it out. Here you go. Will you just pay me $1,000 for me to print something out for you? Is that fair? No, but it happens. When you go buy a house, your client goes by as a half a million dollar house, 1% is charged for the origination fee. Think about that. Mr. Eugene, 1% of $500,000 is how much money, sir? $50,000 for them to end up, for them to do a loan. Is that fair? No, but they do. Now this bottom one is extremely important, okay? It's called a prepayment penalty clause. Now, Colton, let, let me ask you this for a minute. So I'm going to ask you this question. You end up, you come to this class, you go through all the two weeks of class, the trainings and everything, and you actually were a proactive student. The class is two weeks long, and you end up, Colton, you complete all the stuff. You take a week off from work, and you do all the reading, all the assignments in one week, okay? What would a normal teacher do in that situation? be patted on the back, right? Great job. You did good, man. You're on top of it. I'm proud of you. Is that the right response, Ms. Linda? Yeah, it should be. He's proactive, okay? But let me say this. What would you do, Colton, if you finished everything in a week, okay? And then I walk over and I say, you failed. Get out of my classroom. 
You did everything right, but you failed. You made 100 on every exam, every quiz, did it all right. You didn't cheat at all. Okay, there was no cheating. But because you got ahead, I'm failing you. How do you feel about that, Mr. Colton? It's not fair, right? But that's what a prepayment penalty clause is. Prepayment penalty clause is Mr. Eugene back there has a mortgage for 30 years. He happens to work extra hard to pay off his debt so he doesn't have to pay extra interest. He pays it off in 15 instead of 30. The bank turns around and says, shame on you for paying your debts off. We're going to hit you with a prepayment penalty. We're going to hit you sometimes up to five, sometimes 10% of the total loan because you paid your debt off early. Shame on you. Is that fair, Mr. Colton? No. But the thing is, that's what happens. Now, no matter how you feel about Barack Obama, when he was in office, guess what? His administration deleted this. Banks can no longer, on new loans, have a prepayment penalty clause because it was punishing you for doing the right thing. Now, what kind of stuff is that? Like I said, I always bring it down to my college student. It's like you go into class, what your teacher always says first semester. First time you walk into a, into a classroom, Colton, what does the teacher always tell you? Stay on task, get your homework, try to get ahead, do your best, right? That's what a teacher does. What would you do if on the first day I walked in, I'm your teacher, and I'm like, all right, all you SOBs listen up here. Y'all better not go ahead of me, because if you get ahead of me, I'm failing every one of you. You got that? If you do, I'm going to fail you. Now, do you want to be in my class, Mr. Colton? Mr. Eugene, you want to be in my class? No. How many of y'all would drop if I walked in on the first day and did that? I would, in a heartbeat. Okay, and a heartbeat, because the fact is, it's not how real life works. It's not how the real life works. So when we deal with prepayment penalties, understand in this situation that prepayment penalty is basically, it's a punishment for paying your debts. It's a punishment for you paying it, okay? You want to be aware of that because they will test you. Now, my question before I move on to this next one is this. What happens if, say, for example, Mr. Grossman, you're representing Mr. Keith in a transaction, okay? And Mr. Keith ends up, he comes to you and he says, well, Mr. Grossman, um, I, I have a house that I bought like 15 years ago and I have another 15 years ahead, like a 15 year, more years ahead of it, but I'm gonna go in and pay it off. What do you think? You're an expert in real estate. Should I go in and do that, Mr. Grossman? I would. Yeah, you would, but that's not what you advise your client to do. What are you supposed to advise your client to do? They need to, number one, read their promissory notes for what? What did we just talk about? To see if a prepayment penalty clause is in their mortgage. Because if they pay off their mortgage prior to the term and it ends up, it has a prepayment penalty clause, what exactly did you just do to Mr. Keith? You just, you cost him a lot of cash. And understand, a prepayment penalty clause do you think, Miss Linda, that they say, oh, Miss Linda, you, you paid off too much, so you owe us 5%, but you pay those in payments. Do you think they do that? Heck no. Here's your bill, $100,000. Pay it all up front, or you're in default of this, of this agreement. They still do yes, sir, they still have prepayment. They did not just recently stop until, when did Obama get out of office? 18? I can't remember what year. Well, four years from 16. So, okay. So that's when it officially, any of them started around 15, 16. That's when they stopped doing it. So will you all have clients that might have prepayment penalties? Yeah. Yeah. 
But here's the thing. If your client is selling their house, Mr. Colton, you're selling your house to go buy another one and they pay it off so you can go buy, that's not a violation of the prepayment. The prepayment is only if you decide, I want to pay off my house. I want to pay my house off. And so I pay my house off. I'm not selling it. I'm just paying it off. We're going to punish you for that. Okay. Why do you think the banks were so adamant about prepayment? They can make more money, but here's the thing. All right, Mr. Eugene, you're a bank real quick. Miss Linda walks in and she says, uh, I want to buy a house for $100,000. Can I have a mortgage, sir? And you say, well, most certainly, Miss Linda. Here you go. Here's your $100,000. Okay. Now, as a bank, Mr. Eugene, you've owned houses before. Do you hold on to that debt for the, the entire 30 years that Miss Linda has ended up? She's got the debt. Yeah. What happens to it? It's sold off to investors, right? You're not going to hold on to that because if you, because you as a bank are just like anybody else, you only have so much money. So if you had, let's say, $500,000 and you just gave Miss Linda 100000 bucks, how much money you got left to lend out? You got 400 That's right. And are you going to sell it off for $100,000? Mr. Colton's an investor. Are you going to sell it to Mr. Colton for $100,000? No. You're going to sell it off to Mr. Colton for what? For whatever the whole 30 years is of that deal. So if her paying off 30 years is $300,000, you're going to sell to Mr. Colton for maybe two hundred, so he'll make a hundred thousand dollar profit. You end up, you get the remainder of the two hundred, so you get your hundred back plus another hundred, so you can keep doing this. But what happens, Mr. Colton, from your standpoint, if Miss Linda pays it off once she's paid the two hundred thousand dollars? How much money do you make? He makes two hundred thousand profit, and she pays two hundred. What's left over for you? Zippo. So in that situation, what's the point of you even buying a note? There's none. We're not in the business to break even, are we? We're in the business to make money. Okay. So what happens is, is you would penalize her for paying it off because you made no profit and you're not in the business to just break even. So in that situation, what occurs here is that Miss Linda would be penalized for paying it off because you get basically the bad end of the deal. You see kind of how that works, okay? Now, we're gonna, I beat that to death, but I beat that to death for a reason. It's because you will see that as an entire section when we get to finance. When we get to the actual course, we're gonna talk about that, okay? And they test you a lot about it. They will actually put it out there like I did with Mr. Grossman. They will say, a client comes to you for advice. Okay, it's not legal advice, it's not financial advice. They come to you for advice in regards to the fact, should I pay off my notes? Most people, common sense, is going to say what? Yeah, pay it off. Pay off your debt. But in reality, if you tell them to do that, what happens is, is you may just got your client hit with a double whammy. They paid off their note, but now here comes another note that could possibly have them in breach of contract and they lose the house when they think that they did the right thing. Yes, Ms. Linda. I have a question now. Okay, you have a question. For instance, you purchase a house. Yes, ma'am. And you have a mortgage on the house. Yes, ma'am. And you have a mortgage on the house. Yes, ma'am. And you have a mortgage on the house. Yes, ma'am. You're paying your monthly notes every month. Yes, ma'am. And then all of a sudden, you want to refinance your home. Okay, so you want to refinance. Okay. And for cheaper interest rates. Okay, for cheaper so rates, okay. As you go ahead and pay, because the interest rates are cheaper, you see that you save a couple of hundred dollars a month that you apply to the principal that will allow you to pay off the note. Yes, earlier. you're trying to pay it off earlier, yes, ma'am. Depends if you have a prepayment penalty clause. If you do, yes. Yes. That's why I tell a lot of my clients all the time in this situation is this, don't pay off your properties early. 
take cash, keep the cash in your bank account, say, have a little savings on the side. Because if something goes wrong, you got some money on the side. You already have the money. See, a lot of people, and this is getting into investing advice, and I'm not going to get too much into this, but that's why I tell people all the time. A lot of people, they'll get an extra little cash here on the side. Miss Linda, let's say that you got a bonus of $2,000. She gets a bonus for $2,000, Miss Linda does what with it? Miss Linda goes over and she says, huh, I'm gonna pay an extra payment on my mortgage so that I get a month ahead. Do you actually ever get a month ahead, Miss Eugene? No, your payment's still due the next month. It's still gonna continually be due. So why would you go put it to your mortgage when you could take that $2,000 and do what? Maybe go start a business, go invest in something to grow that money then end up paying when you still have the same debt over and over and over and over again. Does that make sense, Ms. Linda? It makes sense. Okay. So the key thing in that situation is you don't want to pay off your debts early. It's better to, to stockpile the money, put it in, in, in an investment, grow that money, and then when that money has grown to a certain point, make one payment and pay it all off. Does that make sense? Then at that situation, then what you end up doing, is you refinance the mortgage. If it has a promissory note, you refinance the mortgage with a new term, which is now, which won't have a promissory note. And then you go pay it off. Do you see what I'm saying? But again, that's why you as realtors, it is your duty because you will have people that will come into you. I guarantee you, Colton, you quote me on this. So you keep taking these classes, your mom or your dad's going to come up to you and be like, hey, son, we have X, Y, Z with our real estate. What should we do? They're going to come to you for advice. You're the expert. You have to be able to think about these things. If your mom and dad, before you came in here today, if your mom and dad said, hey, Colton, you're taking the real estate courses. Should we pay off our mortgage? What would you have told them? Yeah. Pay it off, mom and dad. Then they paid it off and they get hit with a fee. Who are they upset with? you because you didn't know the stuff so the key thing comes back to is yes you would want to tell your parents that but you got to be able to understand how it works does that make sense and that's why i beat these things to death is because of the fact is you'll have your parents and friends okay that'll come talk to you but yes mr colton the reason i bring this up for you and i'm picking on you on this situation is because my mother and father they are trying to pay off their mortgages but I guarantee you in this situation, Mr. Linda, uh, Mr. <laughs> Eugene and Miss, Mr. Eugene and Miss Linda, question for you. Did y'all know anything about this before you came in here tonight? And you were thinking, well, I'm doing a good job paying in ahead, right? Mm -hmm. And now you see that if your debt has a free penalty, you're basically shooting yourself in the foot. Okay, so very important to know. All right, so let's come back here. Now, what are the basics? Now, we're gonna talk about two different things here, okay? You're gonna see two things here on this slide. You're gonna see mortgage and you're gonna see deed of trust, okay? Mortgage is not what we use in Texas. If you don't put something on there, do not use in Texas. In deed of trust, we use in Texas, okay? So, Mr. Garrett, he lives in Florida. And he has a mortgage with his bank. And his banker, Mr. Jacob, is ending up in this situation. He is over here. Basically, Mr. Garrett is going to be the mortgagor. Mr. Jacob is the mortgagee. Mr. Garrett pays Mr. Jacob for 10 years, loses his job, and cannot pay anymore. In order for Mr. Jacob to get his money or get the property back, Mr. Jacob, if it's a mortgage theory state, has to go over and sue Mr. Garrett in court. Now, Mr. Eugene, question for you. Actually, no, I'm picking on y'all now. Mr. Keith, question for you. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Keith. All right, Mr. Keith. It is to go over, sir and get through the court system trying to get a house back if you're a lender uh difficult very difficult right possibly months yes, right sir. 
Yes, so sir. in that situation is, that's a long time. So in this situation, and let me tell you, I can tell you this for a fact, because I remember 2008. It took one person, Mr. Keith, just so you know, took one lender almost three years to get back his house. Three years, the lender, for them to get the house back. For them to get the house back. What do you think about that, Mr. Keith? Uh, that's too long. <laughs> that's way too long, right? Three yes, years sir. for you to get your house back. So in that situation, what happened is this is what we don't use. Mortgage, we don't use anymore. We don't use that because the fact is, is this situation. It takes way too long. If Mr. Jacob is a lender and he's got to wait three years to get his house back, <laughs> or Mr. Jacob may go bankrupt if all of his houses go foreclosed. That's not good, okay? So Texas created what's called a deed of trust. And we're one of a couple of states, but we have a deed of trust. And it's just like a trust. And you will need to know this, okay? A deed of trust, you need to put somewhere on here out on the side next to deed of trust, is not a trust. And you're gonna say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Nobles, hold on, hold on. It has the word trust in it. How can it not be a trust? Right, Miss Linda? Well, because like I said, we gotta confuse you on the licensing exam. We know how much y'all just love being confused. A deed of trust is not a traditional trust. A deed of trust is a mortgage. And you're gonna say, what in the world are you talking about? Mortgage is above here, not below here. No, a deed of trust is a mortgage. It is not a trust, okay? It is a mortgage. However, it is structured just like a trust is. It has a trustor, a trustee, and a beneficiary. Now, a trustor is gonna be the borrower. And the reason it is, remember we said OR, OR means what? They're doing something. So this borrower is setting up a deed of trust, basically a deed that if I'm the borrower here, Mr. Eugene, you're the lender. What I'm doing in a deed of trust state is I'm literally, there is a deed in front of me when I sit at closing that has my name is the, the grantor, and you're the grantee, and it's actually a deal that I'm signing that says that if I don't fulfill my duties of paying you, they already have my signature on a sheet of paper that will go give you ownership right back to the property. So when you sit down and you sign, what's happening is you're signing a document that if you fail to pay, they're gonna give the property back to the lender and they take it back. Do they need court intervention? Not really, they might, but not always. But here's the question here. What in the world is this little dude right here? This little trustee. Who's the trustee, Miss Linda? We know who the, the trustor and the beneficiary are. Who's the trustee? Who is the trustee? No, the trustee is oftentimes, majority of it, gonna be the lender's attorney. So the lender cannot have access to the deed of trust because they don't own the property. So they cannot hold the trust. They can't hold that deed of trust because they don't own it. So the trustee, has to be a neutral third party that both individuals agree on. And who better to have as a neutral third party than the attorney for the lender, okay? So in that situation, these are your two different bases of mortgage, okay? Now, the duties of the mortgage or, or the trust store, doesn't matter who it is, their duties, is they have to pay the debt in accordance with the terms of the note, common sense. 
They have to have payment of all real estate taxes on the property as security. So you have to pay your debt, pay your taxes. And here's the biggest one right here, maintenance of adequate insurance to protect the lender if the property is destroyed or damaged by fire, windstorm, or other hazards. What do you have to have, Ms. Linda? What three items? Pay your debt. Pay your taxes and you have to have insurance on it, okay? And in a moment, we're gonna get to it. If you wanna go in and put it here, you can. We'll talk about it some more in a little while. This is where the PMI come into, or the, not PMI, scratch that, scratch that, don't put PMI, PITI, PITI. Principal, interest, taxes, insurance four things the first two principal and interest fall under the first bullet taxes the t falls under the second one the last i is your insurance falls under the last bullet we call it in real estate piti -I. and what that means is those four debts in most loans are combined into one monthly payment. Okay, if you own a house, you're paying a mortgage, you're most likely paying those four things. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, principal. principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Now where would escrow, in there? escrow is what holds the taxes and insurance money until they're due. So say, Miss Linda, in that situation that you pay your payment on the first of the month and Mr. Keith, he ends up, he's your lender. Mr. Keith receives your payment on the fifth. You pay it on the first, he gets it on the fifth, but it's not due to the 20th. Mr. Keith can't put that in his back pocket and go spend it. Mr. Keith has to put that into an escrow account and then when it's due, he writes a payment out to those out of that escrow account. Because of the class insurance and uh, insurance and taxes can go up and all that. That's correct. Interest can go up, taxes can go up. There's a bunch of things that can occur, but he has to hold an escrow account. That's where money is held. Okay. Now, further, this is the one that most people fail to fulfill. This top bullet right there. Okay. The top bullet, maintenance of the property in good repair at all times. If you do not maintain your property, there's a provision in all deeds and all ownership documents that let's say that Mr. Grossman, he goes over, he buys a house, he maintains his payments, he maintains his taxes, he maintains his insurance. He does all those things. <clears throat> But Mr. Grossman ends up, he doesn't take care of the property. Yards a mess, weeds everywhere, trees, limbs overhanging the roof. He doesn't maintain it. There are some provisions within the deed and within the conveyance that what ends up happening is, is they end up, they turn around and they have a situation where they end up the individuals can actually lose ownership of their property because of the fact is they did not maintain the property. So you may pay everything and do everything you're right, but if you don't maintain your property, that's part of the ownership, that's part of the documents. You don't fulfill it, you can lose your, your ownership. They can come back and repo it. You have to maintain the property. Also, receipt of a lender authorization before making any major alterations. Mr. Eugene buys a new property. He decides that he wants to bust out a wall. He wants to bust out a wall and make a bigger living room. So instead of a four bedroom house, he wants to make it a three bedroom house with a big living room. Okay. Sounds good, right, Colton? He's paying his mortgage and all. He should be able to do that, right, man? Mm -hmm. Well, problem is, 
three bedroom houses in his neighborhood, they don't sell very well. They actually don't sell at all. So what did he just do to the value of that property? Knock that thing down, not all the way to zero, but probably knocked it down significantly. Well, the problem is if I, if you, let's say you lent him money, you lent him cash to own it and his house is your collateral. You lent him $200,000 and by him busting out that wall, that house is now only a hundred thousand. What happened to your collateral? Yeah, you're up a creek without a paddle. So do you see where there's a problem here? So you cannot just on willy nilly say, I'm gonna bust out or I'm gonna make a major repair alteration to my property. You have to let your lender know, okay? And you have to get authorization. You can't just willy nilly do what you wanna do. Now, if it actually adds value to the property, if in a situation, Mr. Eugene is not busting out a deal, but he's adding a room and it increased the value, that's a different story, that's fine. But again, in this situation is, you still, any major alteration needs to be approved by the lender. Now, provisions of default, okay? These are, of course, gonna be included in all documents, and it's basically, if included, there is called an acceleration clause. What's the word, um, Mr. Garrett, what's the word acceleration mean to you, sir? Uh, speed something up. Speed it up, right? Speed it up. Probably what all of you saying this evening is, I wish he would just speed it up, right? Okay. Yeah, one back there shaking his head. So in this situation is, it's a speeding up. It's to get it going. So what this means is in this situation, if you default, Miss Linda does not pay her mortgage this month for December. The next month, I give her a three month grace period. She doesn't pay this month. I'm like, Miss Linda, where's my money? January comes around. She tells me the, the, the check's in the mail. Okay, check's in the mail. January comes around, still no check. Now you're two months behind. Miss Linda, where's that check? Oh, I, I put it in the bank or in the deal and, and the check's coming. It'll be there by the end of the month, I promise you. I wait till the third month, still no check. At that point, that normally triggers the acceleration clause, which now says three months of non-payment. Miss Linda, we're accelerating your note. The entire $200,000 is now due and payable immediately. I need a check for $200,000. Now, why do you think we need to include an acceleration clause, Mr. Garrett? Um. Let me ask you this question, Mr. Garrett. If you're the lender, okay, you're the lender here, Mr. Garrett, do you wanna have to go sue Miss Linda every single month that she doesn't make her payment? Do you wanna go to court and pay court costs and attorneys and all every single month for 30 years, every time she doesn't pay? Do you wanna do that? No, sir. No, that could get very expensive, can't it? So Mr. Yes, Garrett, your, your best thing is what? Let's accelerate it and sue her for what? All One that. time for the whole amount. So in this situation, an acceleration clause allows the lender to fast forward because most likely if she's not paid three months, do you think Mr. Garrett that she's gonna pay the fourth month or the fifth month or the sixth month? Yes, sir. No, not at all because they're not. She's most likely not gonna pay it if she hasn't paid three months, okay? So we have to fulfill, we have to accelerate everything so that what ends up happening is, is Miss Linda can end up, we don't have to sue her every single month. We just sue her for the whole amount, take her house and wham, bam, we resell it. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Go ahead. That's the foreclosure. So we, So what we've just done in that situation is We've accelerated your note. You now owe us $200,000 due immediately. You're not gonna pay it. So I'm gonna go foreclose on your house to get my property back because you didn't pay your debt. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, this next one up here, most of you probably have watched HGTV, okay? 
most of you've ended up seeing HGTV or you've ended up heard of wholesaling, okay? Now, most people that get into real estate, they get into real estate because of this bullet right here, okay? They get into this real, into real estate because of what we call assignment, okay? What happens in this situation is this. Mr. Jacob ends up in this situation. He meets Miss Linda, okay? So he comes up and he finds out that Miss Linda ends up, she is three months behind and about to have her note accelerated, okay? So Mr. Jacob comes up and says, Miss Linda, I will buy your house from you for $150,000 if you sign it, sign this contract to me. And Miss Linda says, what? You'll buy my property for $150,000. I don't have to worry about all this. And I'm going to be good. Yeah, I'll buy it. So Miss Linda signs the paperwork for $150,000. Now, what she doesn't understand is her house is worth $250,000. And I'm using round numbers here. But ended up her house is worth $250,000. But Miss Linda is so freaked out about the lawsuits and everything that she signs the paperwork so that Mr. Jacob can deal with all the headaches. Okay, so Miss Linda signs paperwork. Mr. Jacob now has a house that's worth two hundred and fifty thousand dollars under contract for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Now, do you think that Mr. Jacob, Miss Linda, works for free? Do you think he's just doing that for the kindness of his heart? No. I think so. No. Mr. Jacob's got to make money. He's got to pay bills. So Mr. Jacob ends up, goes to Mr. Darren and says to Mr. Darren, I got a house that's worth $250,000. Now, I'll sell it to you for two hundred, dollars and you'll make a $50,000 profit. The house is ready to go. I just got it under contract. Now, Mr. McLean, Mr. Darren here, he says, heck yeah, I'll take it. I'll make $50,000 profit. I'm not in a rush. So he ends up, Mr. Jacob, if they come to an agreement, is doing what's called an assignment. Okay, He's assigning his interest to another party. Now, to use that same concept, though, and an assignment of the mortgage is the same way. It's where you are assigning your rights without changing any of the provisions of the mortgage. So here's another example. Mr. Um, Keith, will say for an example, Mr. Keith has bad credit. He's a good guy. He just happened to fall on hard times. He lost his job because of COVID. Poor guy's just been just up a creek without a paddle. Everything that could go wrong goes wrong for Mr. Keith. Poor guy. And Mr. Justin here wants to end up, he wants to help Mr. Keith out. He knows he's gone through hard times and he wants to end up, he wants to sell his property, but he would rather sell it to a friend than to some stranger. So Mr. Justin says, Mr. Keith, if you go get a mortgage, you're going to pay 8%. I have a mortgage right now that's at 3%. I want you, Mr. Keith, to keep that 3%. So I want you to pay me in cash X amount, and then I want to turn around and I want you to assume my mortgage and you start making payments. Okay, That is an assignment of the mortgage. I am releasing myself of the mortgage and Mr. Keith is assuming it with the same terms that I have been given by the bank. Now, my question is though, Mr. Eugene, do you think that banks allow that anymore? No, not anymore. Because the fact is in this situation, they have a legitimate person that's good with credit and finances. They ran a background check on, they know I'm good for the money, and now here I am giving my same interest to a guy that now has bad credit. Is that wise as a lender, Mr. Eugene? Not at all. 
Not at all. So now if you want to assign a mortgage, you have to now have the lender approve the assignment of the mortgage, okay? And sometimes if the lender says, yes, I will grant it. I will, Miss Linda's the lender. She says, yeah, I'll let Mr. Keith assume the mortgage. Do you think she's just gonna let me off the hook? No, she's gonna say, Mr. Keith, you can assume the mortgage, but Mr. Nobles, you ain't getting off of it. You're still on the hook. So if Mr. Keith don't pay, who's gets, who are they going after, Ms. Fulton? Me, okay? So that's an assignment of the mortgage. It's a way where you can assign things, and if they don't pay, they come back after the other individual. There's, a, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand what you're saying and all that stuff. Come on, we can. If it's foreclosed, there is no interest anymore. That person's out of it altogether. Okay. Once it's foreclosed, any agreements that's there is dead and gone on its face. That person is no longer involved. Now, <laughs> that's why I say I could teach you on this forever. I got to add one more thing to that because I just, you got to know this stuff. Say, Miss Linda, that Colton is the borrower. You're the lender, okay? Colton owes you $200,000, all right? And he ends up, he owes you $200,000, but he can't pay it. So you foreclose on him. But when you sell it to Mr. Grossman at the sale, Mr. Grossman only pays you $150,000 for the house. What happens to the other $50,000 that Mr. Colton pays or owes you? No. You would sue Colton in court and get a judgment against him for $50,000 and take other assets that he has to fulfill the debt that's owed. Does that make sense? Okay. Remember, we're not at a tax sale, we're at a foreclosure. You got to remember the differences here. Okay. Now, <clears throat> In regards to the release, now this is the most easiest one. This one's easy. What's the word release mean, Colton? Let go. Let go. So it means we're letting go of the interest. We're letting go of the lien, the deed. We're letting go of it. And the ways that they get or it's done is through satisfaction. And what that means is, is if Colton paid you off, Miss Linda, he paid off that 200000 you will release his mortgage lien through satisfaction and a release of deed because he's paid, okay? It's just like when you pay off your car. When you pay off your car, what happens to the title to the car? The lender does what? Sends it over to you. You paid it off. We are releasing our interest in it. Here you go. Same concept, real simple, okay? Now, when dealing with tax and insurance reserves, okay? Tax and insurance reserves, Ms. Linda, this is real quick because this is what you asked earlier. This is that TI. Remember the PITI? -I? This is the TI right here. So this is where the taxes and insurance reserves go. So it's the funds are required by the buyers, by some lenders, and they put that money into an impound or an escrow account. So when you make your payments, what ends up happening is, like I said earlier, you pay your payments, like I said earlier, Miss Linda, you pay $1,000 a month, 500 is principal and interest, 500 is insurance and taxes. Well, the insurance and tax, well, let me just say this. Well, how often do you pay your taxes, Miss Linda? Once a, year. Once a year. So can you pay those monthly? No, they have to be set aside in an escrow account. So that money's gotta be set aside. Why don't they just let you have it, Miss Nobles? Why don't they say, Miss Noble, you just pay your taxes once a year to us? Well, let's be real. What what happens most likely? If you have an extra five hundred dollars in your bank a, a month, you're gonna spend that money, and then it comes due, and now you can't pay it. Now we're up the creek without a path. Okay. So in this particular situation, this is where we use that impound. We're holding that money in order to end up 
paying the debt off at a later time, okay? Now, when we're talking about mortgages and deeds of trust, we do have things called a buying to, okay? Or I mean, a subject to, okay? So buying subject to or assuming a seller's mortgage or deed of trust. Now, a subject to is that the buyers take title but are not personally obligated to pay the debt in full. Okay. So the buyers take title but are not personally obligated to pay the debt in full. What in the world here? Well, looky here. Whose mortgage is it? The seller's mortgage. What did I say earlier? If somebody assumes a debt and they don't pay, they're coming after me, period. So the same concept is, is if I sell my property subject to, to say Garrett, what ends up happening is Garrett will get title, but he's not gonna personally be obligated to pay the debt in full because who do they come after? Me, if it ain't paid, okay? Assumption is where the buyer becomes personally obligated for the payment of the debt. If a novation, here's key, if a novation is executed, read that last sentence there, Mr. Eugene, out loud. <clears throat> There you go. So in this situation, if it's not a subject to, but a full assumption, I am released of my liability and the new buyer now is 100% personally obligated to pay the debt. Okay, so very key but there has to be a novation. And Mr. Grossman, I'm gonna test you here, you ready? This is a very hard question. It's like rocket science, you ready? What is the first two letters of novation? Uh, no. That was rocket science, right? It, and what does the word no mean? No. It's not there anymore, right? It's gone. So in that no. situation, it means no, right? So novation means there is no longer a contract, okay? Now, an alienation clause is going to prevent the future purchaser from being able to assume it though. So if in this situation, your note has an alienation clause, it's going to prevent any future person from being able to assume that one. So when I look at a mortgage or a promissory note, and I go through the documents and I see an alienation clause that tells me this note cannot be assumed. So if there's an alienation clause and Mr. Eugene, you want to transfer your mortgage to your son so that I can pick up the payments and start taking it. Well, if there's an alienation clause, I can't take it. I cannot legally take it because it prevents me from actually having ownership, okay? Now, when we're recording a mortgage or deed of trust, it must occur in the recorder's office of the county in which the real estate is located. But wait a minute, Miss Linda, got a question here. We got, we got a problem here, Miss Linda. Mr. Darren, he lives in Florida and he's bought a house in Montgomery for him to have him a, a weekend home. You're telling me that Mr. Darren is gonna to have to come all the way from Florida. You're gonna make him come all the way from Florida to record his mortgage and his deed here in Montgomery County? You're pretty mean. Yes, that's why That's not nice. So you're telling me that he, there's no exceptions? He, I mean, he lives in Florida. You're going to make this poor boy come all the way back from Florida. You're going to make him mail it. Man. Man. 
you're you're a mean lady here. I mean, that's pretty sad. But see, that's the thing is, they use that on the test. They're going to give you some sob story about some person lives way out of the state or they're out of the country and they bought some property and they need to get paperwork recorded and they can record it where they're at, right? Huh? No, they have to go to the property, okay? That's correct. So the key thing, and I emphasize that because you will see that on your test, I promise you that, the deed or anything relating to that property must be in the county in which the real estate is actually located. Even if you reside in Maine and you're buying in California, you have to file the paperwork where the real estate is located. You cannot, cannot file it where your primary residence is if you're out of state. It has to be within the county where the real estate is located, okay? Now, <clears throat> priority of a mortgage or deed of trust is going to be determined by what, Ms. Linda? By the order in which they were recorded. What did, Ms. Linda, what did you used to always tell uh, me and my sister? The early what gets the worm? What does that mean? What's the early bird gets the worm, Miss Linda? So first come, first serve. So in that situation, what that means here is this situation. The person that is first to get their paperwork filed takes priority in regards to payment. Now, let me tell you how important that is. All right. Mr. Colton, you ready here, sir? All right, man. So, Mr. Colton, you and I were both lenders, we're bankers, work for two separate banks. Mr. Eugene walks into your bank and he says, I want to get approved for a mortgage. He wants $200,000. You look at his credit and say, I'll give you $20,000. Okay. So he says, I'll take it. I'll take $20,000. So he comes to me. He says, I need to get a, a, a loan for $80,000 or $180,000 because I'm buying a house. So, all right, I'll give you $180,000. Mr. Eugene, how much do you have now between me and Mr. Colton here? $200,000. So Mr. Eugene has this $200,000. Now, here's the thing. I'm lazy. You're not. You're an early person. You get down to the county, you file your lien against Mr. Nobles' house, and you stamp it, everything, and you have your spot. I come down two days later, I file mine. Okay? Who has priority? You. Mr. Colton does, not me. So Mr. Eugene, after a couple of months, he ends up he stops paying you and me, both of us. He stops paying us, okay? Got his house, he stops paying us. I go file suit against Mr. Eugene first because he owes me a lot of money. Then you go file. Whose case are they going to hear first? Yours. They're going to hear yours first because you're priority. I'm not. Even though I filed first, you're first because you filed first. So I'm what they call a junior lien holder. I'm second. So you go sue Mr. Eugene. Bank says, Mr. Eugene, we're foreclosing on your property and we're going to sell it. It's a $200,000 property. They sell Mr. Eugene's property for $150,000. Okay? Because of your lawsuit. How much money do you get? Huh? He, we sold it for 150. He owes you 20. How much money you get? No, you just get your 20 because you only can get how much you borrowed him. Okay. He owes me 180. How much do I get? 130. Now, what happens if we were flipped? 
what happens if I was first filing and you were second and we sell his property for 150? How much do I get? And how much do you get? None. You see why that's important? Huh? Of course he can sue you. He can sue you, of course. But do you see why it's important? You want to take priority because you're the first one that gets the money. So in that situation, if it sells lower, you may end up, if you're the $20,000, you get your money. The other one ain't. Okay. How many more? Okay. Now, when we talk about provisions of landlord contracts and owner financing, now the buyer agrees to make a down payment and monthly loan payment of interest and principal and possibly tax and insurance reserves, okay? Now, the seller does retain legal title until the end of the loan term, but the buyer, of course, would be granted equitable title and possession, okay? These are basic terms that you should be just aware of, and we'll go into these in more detail when we get to that, but those are some basic terms. Now, Ms. Linda, this is that one that you loved a lot. It's called foreclosure, okay? Foreclosure is basically, it's property pledged as security that is sold to satisfy a debt, okay? So if you fail to fulfill your obligation, they will sell that property that is called what, Mr. Eugene? What, when, they, when they hold something for the loan, what do we call that? It starts with a C. Collateral. So in foreclosure, the property is collateral, so they're gonna sell it to get their money back. But like we've already established, sometimes you don't get the full amount back. Sometimes you only get a portion, okay? Now, the methods in which we use foreclosures is we have judicial foreclosure, non-judicial foreclosure, and strict foreclosure, okay? Of course, what do we think judicial means? What are we including in this situation? If it's a judicial foreclosure, what is it? It's courts. We're gonna utilize the courts. So in a judicial foreclosure, it allows the property be sold by the court order after sufficient notice has been given to the mortgagor. Now the problem with this is the word sufficient notice. All right, Mr. Colton. What's sufficient? How many months does that, or years, does sufficient mean to you? What do you classify as sufficient? Okay, how many? Give me a number. 30 months, 30 years, what? 30 years. 30 years, you think sufficient? Mr. Eugene? Yeah. Ms. Linda? Mr. Stephan? Um, sufficient notice, one week. Okay, here's the thing. What did I just establish? Everybody has what? Their own, their own determination of what the word sufficient means. Yep. So the problem is 30 may be excessive, yep. but three years might be sufficient. One week might be sufficient. Two months might be sufficient. It's to the interpretation of who? Who did we just say earlier? The court. Yeah, the courts make that decision. So in that situation is, you may be stuck for six years before a court will actually issue an order. So in that situation, it's the slowest, okay? Non-judicial foreclosure, there is no court order and it requires to sell the property by an auction. A strict foreclosure, is after notice to the mortgagor, who's the mortgagor? We've said it a million times. Starts with the B, the buyer or the borrower. After notice to the borrower, the court establishes a deadline for payment. And if it's not paid, then the court awards the full legal title to the lender. Okay, that's another option. Now, this is my favorite one. I love this one. A deed in lieu 
is this situation. A deed in lieu of foreclosure is basically what we call a friendly foreclosure. Okay? So what happens is the mortgagor, and who's the mortgagor? The buyer or the borrower, gives deed to the mortgagee. Who's the mortgagee? The lender. And when the mortgagor is in default, that's what occurs. So what happens here is in this situation, if you know that you're about to lose your property, you most likely want to do what? You don't want to go through going through the foreclosure process, being served, you know, having to go to court, being embarrassed. You don't want to deal with all that stuff. What you do is you call up the lender. Hey, Miss Linda, this is uh, Justin. I can't afford a mortgage anymore. I'm just going to do a deed in lieu of foreclosure and give you back title. I'll sign over my interest. You take it back. You let me walk away. I mean, just get out of here, please. And Miss Linda, would you rather go and do a deed in lieu or would you rather end up going and hiring a bunch of attorneys and, and take me to court? Yeah, you wouldn't want to go to court. It costs a lot, right? So you'd rather do this. So a deed in lieu is an option to end up getting through the foreclosure process without actually going through it, okay? Now, this is the difference here between a tax sale and a foreclosure. In a foreclosure, there's what's called a redemption period in some areas, okay? And a redemption period basic, basically is the equitable right of redemption after there's been default, but before the foreclosure, the borrower can pay their defaulted amount to the lender and their debt is reinstated and they can continue to pay. While with a statutory right of redemption, it's the default that borrowers can redeem their real estate after the sale. However, Texas does not recognize a statutory. We recognize an equitable, but we don't recognize a statutory, okay? Very key there. Now, a deed to purchaser at sale, it's where the successful bidder receives the deed if there is no right of redemption. So in Texas, when a foreclosure occurs and that final hammer comes down, it's sold. It's done. Okay. After the foreclosure, the mortgagee may have the right to a deficiency judgment. That's why I said y'all would have sued Colton against the borrower for any unpaid balances. Okay. Now, we're getting to the good part here. All right. The real estate financing market. So, and we're not going to spend a ton of time on this because when we get into the finance part, we're going to spend an entire chapter on this. All right. So I'm going to come in and we're just going to hit the basics here. So the Federal Reserve System, often recalled as the Fed, consists of, and you need to know this, 12 Federal Reserve District Banks. You've got to know that. And it regulates the flow of money and interest rates in the marketplace. That's its job. So the Fed handles and controls money. But you need to know that there are 12 districts. They will ask you that on the licensing exam. Now, this is another prime area they love to test on. There is two types of mortgage markets. There is what's called a primary mortgage market and a secondary mortgage market. Now, I'm going to sum this up real quick before we go through these. Primary mortgage market is where you go to borrow money. You go to the bank, you go down to your local Bank of America, Chase, uh, any of those, Capital One, they are all classified as the primary market, okay? So these are individuals where you yourself go to get a mortgage, okay? And it consists of lenders that earn income from these bullets. They charge you finance charges at closing, they, those things being origination fees and discount points. There's also reoccurring income. So there's interest collected during the term of the loan. There's funds generated by the sales of loans to the secondary market. 
And there are fees for loan servicing for other mortgage lenders and investors who have purchased them. So ultimately, the lenders, the ones that you deal with on a daily basis, make their money off of these bulleted points right here. Now, again, dealing with the same primary market, the lenders are going to be the fiduciary lenders, which are thrifts, savings associations, and commercial banks credit unions, mortgage banking companies, and mortgage brokers, okay? I am a mortgage broker. And so in that situation, a mortgage broker, I end up a little difference between a banker and a broker. A mortgage banker works for a bank, okay? As a mortgage broker, I work for a ton of banks. I can go and pull a ton of different banks and quote you on your mortgage, okay? but these are the people that you deal with at the primary level. Well, while dealing with a secondary mortgage market, it's gonna be where the loans are bought and sold after they're being funded. So normally at this point, you're dealing with investors, all right? You're dealing with investors at this point. It provides additional income to lenders to make more loans. And with lenders, they're often retaining the services function for a fee. The purchase, uh, they purchase mortgage loans through agencies that assemble them into packages. We call them pools and we sell them as securities, okay? This is where at the secondary market, you as an individual will not see this unless you're an investor, okay? So you cannot just walk down to a bank today and say, go down to your local bank and say, hi, uh, Mr. Uh, Chase Bank, um, I would like to buy some pools to invest my money in. You can't do that, okay? You actually have to purchase them as securities, oftentimes on the security exchange market, okay? You don't have access to this. It's through a different way. You don't easily just go down to the second more, or secondary market. Now, they're in this situation, the two largest is your Fannie Mae and your Freddie Mac, okay? And both of these end up, they're normally governmentally backed, okay? So Fannie Mae creates mortgage-backed securities using pools of conventional FHA and VA loans, while Freddie Mac purchases mortgages, pools them, and then sells them as securities on the open market. These are your two big dogs in regards to the secondary market. Now, we also have Ginny May, and Ginny May is a division of HUD, and they administer special assistance programs and also have guaranteed mortgage backed securities that are going to be based upon FHA and VA loans. There is also the FHLA or FHLB which is the Federal Home Loan Bank. These are individuals that they purchase loans from members within their bank. So they're an association and they purchase loans from member banks. And then you have Farmer Mac, okay? Farmer Mac does the same thing, but I wonder, Miss Linda here, what type of loans would Farmer Mac deal with? They deal with agricultural related loans. They do not deal with residential. You will see them ask you, does Farmer Mac deal with residential? And the answer is no, okay? Now, in regards to this financing techniques, and again, before I jump into this, I wanna explain something. What we just gone through, that was a lot of material, okay? But we will spend an entire class an entire two hours going over what we just talked about. That's why I don't want to spend a long time on that. I want to hit the basics, hit the bullets, and keep running, okay? Now, there are different types of financing techniques. There is the straight loan, and this is what we call a term loan or interest-only loan. What happens is, is it's periodic payments of interest only for the life of the loan with the payment of the principal in full at the end of the loan term. Mr. Eugene, why'd you make that face, sir? Oh, well, I don't like to pay at the end of the day. 
You wouldn't want to pay two hundred thousand dollars on your very last payment. No, unless I still be rich. Why would? Oh, wouldn't you want to pay your whole truck off just in one payment at the very end? Why are you shaking your head? No, that's a good deal, right? No, it's horrible. But guess what? There are some people that end up they have bad credit. They have terrible credit. This is the only way they can get a mortgage. They have to end up. They have to use a term. They pay their interest. Their interest may be three, four hundred bucks a month, but they get to live in the house. Okay. But at the very end, if they get a 30 year loan, they just got to hope they die within that 30 years. Because otherwise, if they're alive on that last payment and they don't pay it, that house is gone. There's also what's called interest only mortgage. It requires the payment of interest only for a stated period with the principal balance due at that end of that term. So in an interest only, you're going to make payments of just interest, maybe five years. And then afterwards, it jumps up because it starts including principal into the payment. So you pay interest, payments are low, after five years, jumps up. Okay. This is the best of the best. Best of the best, right, Miss Linda? Why don't you like this one, Miss Linda? Beautiful, right? The balloon. Who could not like a balloon? You don't like a balloon? Colton, you like balloons, right, man? No? So balloon payments are what we call partially, and if you want to put this next to this word, when we talk about amortization, what we're talking about is how the payment's paid over the length. So if you're what's called fully amortized, it means that when you pay your last payment, you owe nothing, okay? But if you're partially amortized, when you pay your last payment, guess what? You may have a huge payment at the end, okay? So a balloon payment loan is what we call periodic payment of interest and principal, not though great enough to pay down the entire amount that's borrowed by the end of the loan term. Therefore, resulting in a larger final payment. Exactly. All of these are not what you want to. These are the loans that you don't want to be dealing with because they end up, they can come back and they can bite you. Okay, they can be bad. Now, this one is what Colton loves. Because Colton, what did I just tell you? If it's what? What's that mean? Once you pay it off, what happens? It's zeroed out. So if it is what's called an amortized, fully amortized loan, it's equal to periodic payments of interest and principal resulting in, what's this word, Miss Linda? Exactly, complete payment. You have paid it. So when you pay your last payment, how much do you owe, Miss Linda? Not one penny. You paid it off. Okay. Now, this one is not what you think it is. We're not talking about we're taking your arm. Although some people think, uh, although some people do lose their arm in this one, and they lose everything, not just their arm. Okay. This is what's called an adjustable rate mortgage, okay? An adjustable rate mortgage is where you pay a very lower initial rate of interest in the beginning. So we may end up, we say, Mr. Eugene, we know you have bad credit. We understand that you're ending up, you can't pay a lot. So Mr. Eugene, we're gonna end up, we're gonna put you in an adjustable rate mortgage. And because of rates right now, we will lock you in for five years at 2.8% interest, Mr. Eugene. That's nice, five years, you're stuck to that, sir. Well, after five years, we're gonna to go to what the value is of interest in those five years. Well, in five years, interest jumps up to 12%. So Mr. Eugene was at 2.8% for five years, he loves payments. After five years, it jumps up to 12%. Mr. Eugene's payment just skyrocketed. And guess what ends up happening? He basically lost that house. Okay. So 
It is where the lower initial rate of interest that may change over the life of the loan, and it's based off of specified index, usually tied to the United States Treasury securities. So if they go up, guess what happens to your payment? It goes up, okay? It's how it works. Now, reverse mortgage is great if you're dealing with an older couple or even just a, an older individual, okay? Say, for example, that you know someone that they just recently lost a family member. Say it's their husband or their wife, one of the two. Their older person, they've lost that individual. A reverse mortgage might be an option for that individual, okay? A reverse mortgage is where payments are made by the lender to the borrower. Sounds good so far, right? Okay. And they're paid in regular intervals, such as they could be monthly, in a lump sum, or as a line of credit to be drawn against. And it allows the borrower to remain in the home while they're receiving their income. Wait a minute. You're telling me I'm going to live in my house and the bank's going to pay me? Sounds good, right, Colton? That's a good thing. But what happens when I die? What do you think happens to my house, Colton? Goes, Goes to the bank. So I may come to an agreement with the bank in this one, where the bank and I, we come to terms and the bank says, uh, let's say, Mr. Colton, you're the person here, you're older, and me and you come to terms. And I say, all right, Mr. Colton, I will pay you for 30 years, 1500 a month. Okay, but when you die, payments cease and I get the house. Okay, so he's like, heck yeah, that sounds good. I'm getting payments. I'm going to live for 30 years. We're good. Col or Colton signs his name. He comes in. I go to send him his first check. He croaks. What happens to those 30 years of payments, Mr. Colton? He ain't getting them. Is your mom or dad getting them? Sister, brother, any of them? No, it's done. And how much did I get a house for? For free. So in that situation, a reverse mortgage can be good if the person has a long life expectancy. But it can be horrible if the person has a short life expectancy. Okay? Because once it's done, it's done. Okay? He could take a lump sum. But what do you think the bank's going to, what do you think the bank prefers him to do? We want to do monthly. Because if we do monthly, what's going to happen? I got a higher chance of him croaking. That's right. But also understand in a lump sum, do you think I'm going to give him the, the highest price? No, if we're going to give a lump sum, I may give you 70% of the total amount. Say that again. This is being said. Mm -hmm. Nope. You well, what happens is you've already bought the house and you're you're paying on the house, and now you're in a bad situation and you need to end up selling the house, but you don't want to leave it. So the bank comes in and pays off your other mortgage and starts paying you the difference. So say for example, you owe a hundred thousand on a two hundred thousand house, this reverse mortgage, they come in and pay for the hundred, there's a hundred left over. They'll pay you a monthly payment of that hundred thousand dollars to pay you back. The money that they're paying is going towards the house anyways. That's basically right. But if you die before they pay off all of it, they bought that house at a discount. And so what happens if you pay off the house and by let's say that the time that, that let's say that you don't die within a extent of time that you will they give you. you will. They purposely set it for where you're gonna be dead. So what they'll do is this is only for people that are normally 65 or older, and they do terms for 30 years minimum. Not many people live past 95 or live to 95. Yes. What if you have two, uh, both husband and wife, on the contract, and only one guy? No, no, no. You can't have both. Only one. Only one. Only one. Yep. Only one person. All right. Now, a purchase money mortgage is a note and mortgage that's created at the time of the purchase. Now, a package loan, and this is something you'll actually see a lot in new homes, okay? 
new homes utilize a package loan. Now we have a guest here and I'm glad, hold on a minute, I, I wanna ask you real quick. So Mr. Moreno, you, you deal with a lot of, of like dealing with finances and all, I got a question for you. Is it ever smart, ever wise, to put personal property into a real estate mortgage. Wrap it all together. They can take it, but how much do you, do you want to pay interest on something that has, for example, if you're a builder, are you going to put fancy, nice tables in the house? Or are you going to put cheap tables in the house? You're going to put the cheapest tables in there, right? So Mr. Colton here, he's a, he's a buyer, first time home buyer. He comes in, he's like, oh man, I love these fancy tables here. Love these fancy chairs. Now, are you going to go and be nice, Mr. Moreno, and tell Mr. Colton, I'm going to let you pay costs, Colton. You just pay what I paid for it, okay? Is that how this works? No, what are you going to tell Colton? And how much are you going to charge you for this? Premium. Yeah, so he's going to tell you, Colton, he's going to tell you this. I paid $100, he says, for these. He don't tell you that. He paid a hundred, but he ends up saying, these are prestige, nice wood. See all of this. We'll sell this to you for a thousand dollars for this, for this table. Do you know any different? No. So what happens? They end up in most new home builders, they have their own mortgage company. So they're going to, they paid a hundred dollars for this 50, 50. So say 200 bucks. They charge you for all of this 2,500 bucks. Okay. They pay 200. Then they put you in a package loan right here, all right? They put all your personal property in the house all together, they wrap it together and guess what they end up doing, Colton? Then they charge you interest on top of this because you put it into your mortgage. So by the time you pay all this off, you paid this $200, you ended up paying $5,000 for it. What do you think about that, Colton? You got screwed, didn't you? Mm -hmm. But they do it all the time. So in that situation is a package loan is going to end up being, it's got to include all personal property and appliances, as well as real estate. Now, construction loans, of course, are also going to finance the construction of the property and any improvements as well. Okay. Now, there are what we call buy downs. Okay. And you can buy down if a payment is going to be made at closing to the interest rate. We often call that a discount rate or discount point. What happens is, uh, Mr. Garrett decides that he doesn't want to pay $1,500 a month. He'd rather pay $14. It works better for him. So Mr. Garrett can go in and actually pay a buy down or a discount point to end up reducing his interest rate so his payment would not be $1,500 a month. It would only be $1,400. He's bringing money to closing so that he can reduce his payments. A home equity loan, never a wise idea horrible, horrible idea, only should be in like the worst case scenario. A home equity loan is you're taking equity out of your home so that you can get some credit to go do something. Never, never a wise idea. When I hear people get a home equity loan, I'm just, I cringe. And the reason I cringe is because of this, is that if, for example, Mr. Keith, he owns a house, okay? His house is protected by what if it's his primary residence from creditors? What do we call that, Miss Linda? What did you say? Homestead. It's his homestead. I heard you, Mr. Keith, there. It's his homestead. Mr. Keith is ending up, he's protected by his homestead. Okay? So in that particular situation, if he ends up, creditors, credit card companies can't take his house from him then why in the world would he want to go get a home equity loan to go take money to go buy something? Because here's the thing, who can come breach the homestead veil, as we call it? The mortgage company. You don't pay your mortgage, they come take your house. You go take a $500 home equity loan out on your house and you don't pay it, Guess who gets to foreclose on your house? The mortgage company. So it is the worst case scenario to end up 
having a home equity loan because of the fact is it ends up, it is just like a mortgage and they can come take it. Now, very key, this last little word here, these last few words, very important. It will always be a junior to the original lien, which goes back to what I said earlier between me and Colton. Colton, if he's a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit or a home equity loan, if he was the HELOC and I'm the original loan holder, I would get paid first, he gets paid second. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the next one is conventional loans. Conventional loans are going to be the most secured loans. And these are the best loans. Okay. A conventional loan is going to end up, it comes from, if you want to put it down, it comes from a bank. It does not, it is not governmentally backed. There's no governmentally backed conventional loans. It is a bank using their own money. So Mr. Grossman is a bank. Do you think, Mr. Grossman, I'm going to ask you this question. Are you, Mr. Grossman, if uh, Mr. Jacob comes into you, to you, and Mr. Jacob says, I want to borrow $500,000, are you going to be lenient and be like, yeah, Mr. Jacob, I, I don't care. I trust you. Here's your $500,000. Or are you going to be like, Mr. Jacob, we need to do a finance check, a, a employment check, a credit check, a background check. Are you going to do that one or the other one? Why are you going to check everything, Mr. Grossman? Because 500000 is not a small amount of money, and are you guaranteed to get that money back? No. So if Mr. Jacob doesn't pay you, you're pretty much up the creek without a paddle. Okay. So that's why it's the most secured. The loan to value ratio, the LTV, is often the lowest for these loans. They have the lowest. Why? Because it's the bank's home money at risk. Traditionally, 80%, meaning that they want what? They want 20% down payment. If you're going to get a conventional loan, they oftentimes want 20% down because they're putting their money up. They want you to put your money up. Okay. We're not playing this little back and forth. They want you to be serious. Okay. Now, we also are going to meet all the same requirements of the secondary market. However, we're going to make certain that this loan can be sold and we're going to follow the Fannie and Freddie Mac rules to create what's called a conforming loan, okay? Meaning that it conforms to the standards of Freddie and Fannie. And we're also going to include these following bullets. The borrower's monthly housing expenses, including the PITI, should be no more than 28% of the total monthly gross income. So your mortgage should not be no more than 28% of the total mortgage gross mortgage, not net, gross mortgage for you to get the loan, okay? Imagine if we went off of net instead of gross, how many people would not be having as big of a house they got, okay? But we go off the gross, not the net. The borrower's total monthly obligation, including housing costs and other regular monthly payments, must not exceed 36% of the total monthly gross income. So all of your debt cannot be more than 36% of your income, okay? That's why I tell people often, when you first get into a loan, that's the best time. If you live exactly how they set you up, financially, you'd be set. If you never changed anything and you did this, you would be set. But what happens is, is after a person ends up going and getting a new house, what's the very next thing they often go by right after the house is approved? a brand new car. And then what happens to all of these numbers that they just set you up and fixed, fixed you up with? It's thrown everything and all of a sudden you just took a big old, cheap, a big old, what do you call that? A, a chunk of, of dirt, you just threw up and you just put yourself down the ground. When, they, when you buy a house, the bank helps get you basically putting your feet back on, on land again. But oftentimes, after a person buys a new house, they got to have a new car to go with the new house. 
And in that situation, it kills their entire financial uh, background, okay? Now, this comes back to what I said a little earlier, PMI. This is what's called private mortgage insurance. Now, if you wanna put underneath on this same slide, you can put MIP. Now, PMI is basically applied to conventional loans and only conventional loans, okay? While MIP is applied to, to FHA, VA, and any of the like type loans, any of governmental loans. They both have the same thing. Once you end up, you've paid off 20% of your debt in a MIP, so oftentimes MIP increases your monthly payment by $100 a month, okay? But once you own 20% of your property, the, MI, or the PMI falls off. So your payment drops, what, $100, okay? But on an MIP, it never drops off. It stays on for the term of the loan. So even if you have 50% ownership, you still end up, you still have MIP. PMI is the only one that can drop after you own 20% of your home. Make sense? Now, when we deal with FHA, we have in this situation, we have a different stance. FHA is the most lax, it's the most laid back, okay? So the borrower only has to put down three and a half percent of the purchase price. What would you say, Colton, if I walked up to you and I said, man, I'll give you $100,000 if you give me $3,500. That's pretty good still, ain't it? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good still. But <clears throat> understand in this situation, it is, if with that low of a rate, you get hit with MIP because there's such a huge chance of you defaulting, they don't want that loan being defaulted and non-paid on. Now the mortgaged real estate must be appraised by an FHA appraiser, very important, and the FHA sets maximum mortgage limits for various regions. So they actually tell you the maximum you can buy with an FHA loan. And the borrower has to meet the standard FHA credit qualification. Now here's the best part. One other thing to add to this list. FHA, they have FHA appraisers. So this person has to appraise the property, but guess what? This person also has to inspect the property. Now an appraiser, Mr. Grossman, what's an appraiser taught? Are they taught how to inspect? Are they an inspector? No, they're not an inspector. They're an appraiser. They know how to value stuff. They don't know how to inspect. So you can have a home inspector come out and say everything looks great, and an FHA appraiser comes out and says, oh, no, there's over $5,000 in damage here. And you'll bring the inspector out and the appraiser, and they both are like, no, 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 no but who ultimately wins? The FHA appraiser. I've had that happen. I've had a home inspector that's been out there arguing with the FHA inspector. And I mean, arguing. And they went back and forth and he's like, do you not understand? He was pulling codes and everything. I'm like, this isn't this, this isn't this. And the FHA appraiser turned to him and looked at him and says, are you certified by the FHA? No, then shut your mouth. That's how it is. They get away with it. It's not fair, but they get away with it, okay? So in that situation is, they can be very strict, okay? Now, a VA guaranteed loans are gonna be backed by the Departments of Veterans Affairs and are available to veterans and their spouses. My question real quick, Miss Linda, how many VA loans do you think you can have active at one time? That's right. You can only have one. 
VA loans are not meant to be investment loans. They're meant to have a place for an individual, a couple that's a veteran to live in it, not for them to make profit off of it, okay? You can only have one VA. Now, my question, Mr. Garrett, how much do you think a person has to put down for a down payment on a VA loan? Uh, nothing. Exactly, Zippo. They don't have to pay one dime in a VA loan. They can walk away and be done with it. They don't have to pay nothing, Zippo, okay? Now, sorry, yes, Ms. Linda. If they wanna put down, they can, but they are not required to in most situations. And most of the time, the seller has to give money to the veteran for them to purchase the house. So the seller, oftentimes when we do a VA loan, we will increase the price so that the seller's not giving any money out. They're basically, we're messing with the finances, but it puts it where the sellers are not losing money and the buyer isn't losing anything. It's kind of a win-win situation, okay? But you gotta play with the terms and on, you gotta get the lender on the page with you. Now, <clears throat> The agricultural loan programs, there's the Rural Housing Service, the RHS. It is part of the Department of Agriculture and has programs to help families purchase and operate family farms. There are different ones here. You have your farm credit system, you have Farmer Mac, and you end up having the federal, which used to be the Farmer Mac used to be the Federal Agricultural Mortgage Corporations. They of course purchase farm loans. Now, truth in lending. Truth in lending. This is going to be something, again, we're going to spend an entire course or a section on this one when we get to finance. But the Truth in Lending Act is often uh, called the Regulation Z. And I'm, I'm going to take a minute here just because of the fact is a lot of people don't see the importance of this, this whole act. And this is why, especially for my younger kids that are here, my younger students, I want you all to see something here. And every time I have a problem with this, so we will see if it can possibly work. Nope. Trying to find a good one for y'all. No, you can't see that. Can y'all see those numbers there at all? Barely, <laughs> okay. I don't, the problem is, is they end up, they don't make it friendly for me to find the pictures anymore. Used to, I could click on it and I could blow it up, no problem. But they've ended up making it more difficult on me. But basically, I'll read the numbers to you because I know some of you, let's see if I can't see this one. Here we go. This is a little bit more clear. Can y'all see that one right here? Barely. All right. So what this first one is, this first box here, is the annual percentage rate. Okay. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Eugene, I want to ask you, is 4.075 a fair interest rate? Is that good or bad? That's pretty good, isn't it? It's not the best, but it's better than normal. Okay. So you probably have to have a high 700 to get about 4%, 4 okay? So you have to have excellent credit. So 4% and Mr. Colton here, good buddy of mine, uh, he is actually gonna finance, he's buying a house for $188,000 and 276 with 71 cents. So he's paying about 188,000, we'll just round it down. Well, he's got 4% interest. Pretty good, right, Colton? Well, the thing here is though, Mr. Colton, for that $188,000 house, your finance with the percentage, it's gonna be $132,349.98. Almost very close to the same amount you're borrowing, you're paying in rent or in the interest. So when you buy that $188,000 house, 
you're paying $320,000 for a $188,000 house. Does that make you rethink your decision to buy that house? Might does, might doesn't. Depends on the situation. But that's what this form is. This is the Truth in Lending Disclosure Statement. Some of you probably can see that, some of you can't. But this is the Truth in Lending. And the whole purpose of the Truth in Lending is that we want to require that when a loan is secured by a resident, that the lenders are actually informing their borrowers of the true cost of the obtain of credit within the following rules. So the key thing here, and my biggest thing that I wanna emphasize on is this. Imagine if Mr. Colton was getting a truck, that was at 4%. Imagine if Mr. Colton was buying a truck at eight, nine, or 10%, and he bought it for $10,000. If four or 5% is almost double, imagine what would happen if it's 10%, maybe four times. So you pay $10,000 for your truck, by the time you pay it off, you may be paying $50,000 for a $10,000 truck. Do you see why it's important that you want to know about the truth in lending? It's extremely important. Guys and gals, I can tell you this. There are people out there that get mortgages that ends out getting car loans that it's about 12 to 19% interest. You think you'll ever pay off that car? Nope. It already depreciates the minute that you drive it off. That's right. Miss Linda, could you do me one favor real quick? Would you grab Mr. Moreno for a minute? He, he had a very good thing. I kind of want him to share with everybody for a second, if he has a moment. He had a, he has a friend that he knows that uh, this friend wanted to buy something. Let me see if he's got a moment. Because he's got some very interesting information that had happened. I don't know if he's got a moment or not, but... Let me see here. He's coming? All right. Hey, Mr. Moreno, I had a quick question for you, sir. I wanted you to kind of, if you could come up here for a second so the people at home can see you. Can you come here for just a second, sir? So we were talking about truth and lending, and we were talking about interest and all, okay? And I was telling him, we were talking about car loans, and I was telling him, I said, that you had knew a guy that had wanted the nice car and all, and that his interest rate, I can't remember what you told me, was it like 19 or something or? Oh yeah, it was 14 and a half percent. 14, 14 and a half percent. And what car did he buy? Dodge Challenger. A Dodge Challenger at 14 and a half percent. Was that a smart move on his behalf? Oh no, it's pretty dumb. He went to the dealership begging him to give him that car. Yeah. I'm knowing that he was getting ripped off. And do you think he uh, will ever pay that car off? No, I think I repoed. Oh, it got repoed. Yeah. So he couldn't pay for it. So look right there, prime example. He couldn't afford it. Do you think that the lender gave him this form, the truth in lending and told him? No, not in that situation. He didn't know. He ended up, he bought this car thinking, hey, I got my car, that's the best thing. But in reality, if you have 14%, we just calculated here just a minute ago, if you have 4%, it's almost double what you borrow at 4%. If you end up, if you have 10%, think about how expensive that is. And his was at 14 and a half. So by the time he paid off, how much did you say that car was worth? $46,000. That If he would have paid it off, it'd been over 200 and something thousand dollars he would have paid at 14%. Colton, you wanna buy that? No, thank you, Mr. Moreno. So in that situation, as you can see, it's imperative that you know your terms, you know your numbers. Advertising is strictly regulated also when it comes to it. Because as we've learned in this class, how many ways can a word be said? A ton of different ways. So we can make it sound good, make it sound bad, whatever we wanna hide, we can make it happen. There's also, and this is the biggest one here, just wanted to read this bottom one out for us. So 
and here's the key thing. You may be like, well, that's not my problem. Yes, it is. Regulation Z and truth in lending applies not only to lenders, but also real estate agents. If you end up, you advertise using trigger terms, you can end up being charged. Say that Mr. Grossman back there, he went out and he was like, you know what? I got this. I'm going to go do this marketing and I'm going to work something out. We're going to partner with a lender and I'm going to market this away and all this. And he markets for one month using trigger terms. And there's 30 days in a month. Mr. Grossman, how much is your penalty for violating the truth in lending and regulation at 30 days? $300,000 that you got to pay, not counting you'd lose your license and possibly go to jail. Very important. There's also the Equal Opportunity or Credit Act, or the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the ECOA. I'm going to tell you real quick, we're running out of time. I'm going to try to speed it up here. The ECOA, you need to understand on the test, they're not going to spell out Equal Credit Opportunity Act. They're not doing that. They are going to put the ECOA, period. They are not going to spell it out. They will do ECOA, they'll do RESPA, but they're not going to spell it out for you. You get to know what that is. That's your duty, not theirs. Why do you think they do that? Because in real life, we talk about that. I don't walk into my real estate office and say, all right, everybody, let's talk about the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. No, I say, all right, that's a violation of RESPA. We can't do that. You have to be able to tell these acronyms. Another thing, Mr. Grossman will agree with me on this. You're going to have to know these different discrimination classifications. So the ECOA protects against the credit basis of race, color, rel religion, national origin, sex, marital status, age, uh, and dependency on public uh, assistance. So in that situation, you're going to have to know, because they're going to ask you on the test, which of these acts protects against race, color, religion, national origin, sex, marital status, age, or dependency on public assistance? And they're going to say ECOA, the EEOC, the RESPA, uh, or none of the above. And you're going to have to know which ones are classified under each one. Now, when we get to the prep course, you're going to love me because I've broken them down and actually have them all for you. OK, but you got to know them. very, very imperative that you know. Them. OK, now the Red Real Estate Settlement Pro uh, Procedures Act, RESPA, ensures that the buyers and sellers are fully informed of all cost at settlement. It is imperative that all clients are aware of what they're purchasing and how much they have to be fully disclosed. OK. So. The computerized loan origination. Now, we're not going to spend too much time on this at all because we don't deal with this. Now, if you're a mortgage broker, you're going to need to know this. But you as a real estate agent will not ever deal with this. Okay. But it's an electronic network for handling loan applications, and it also reduces the approval time. It is also the automated underwriting loan processing programs that's included in Fannie Mae's desktop underwriter, and Freddie Mac Loan Prospector. The credit scoring has become an important part of the loan application evaluation process. You just need to know the key things on this slide is you need to know the words at the top, computerized loan origination, CLO, and you need to know that desktop underwriter is used for Fannie and loan prospector is used for Freddie. That's all you really need to know on this slide, okay? All right, so that basically concludes this evening, okay? So we are done, we'll pick up in the next class, all right?